Hi all, Sam here, lead teacher of ARC 201. This video will introduce you to four super important architectural considerations, or what we're calling in this course, architectural aspects. Pretty much all architects think about these aspects when they're designing. There are other important aspects to consider, but these four are great for students just starting out in architecture. They'll set you up to successfully make beautiful and meaningful architectural projects. You'll begin to familiarize yourself with these aspects in project one by analyzing a historical precedent. Later in the quarter, you'll do your own design projects where you'll get to consider these aspects. In project two, you'll really just focus on daylight. And in project three, you'll be working with all four architectural aspects. Let's go ahead and dive right into the first aspect, earth and sky. Earth and sky is about architecture's relationship with these two fundamental realms. All buildings must rest on or be supported by the earth in some way. A building can be firmly nestled into the earth, peeking out of a hillside, or it can be trying to float above the earth, appearing to defy gravity. But notice that even when a building is intended to appear as if it's floating, it still needs a meaningful and beautiful way to rest on the earth. The earth is a starting point for architecture because it's the starting point for our bodies. That first move is primary. Is it to just mark the boundaries of a place to elevate above on a platform? Maybe like a temple? Or to sink into the earth? Or perhaps the project has both elements in it. Buildings usually reach up towards the sky in one way or another. Throughout history, architects have designed buildings, you know, big, grand, special buildings like temples or churches to reach up towards the sky or towards the heavens, as if we're getting closer to God by building a taller, lighter building. The focus throughout history of architecture's relationship to the earth and the sky is really just an extension of our own body's connection to the earth and the sky. You know, we occupy both realms. When we walk, we plant our feet on the earth and the rest of our body is moving through the sky. And when we stop and rest, we kind of make a space or a place around us that's ours. A lot of architects call this identification of place. This is a more complex version of the same concept we're working on in ARC 201, Earth and Sky. It's really just a connection to these two realms and that architecture and our bodies mediate between these two realms. In this course, think about architecture's connection to the earth and the sky as if it's related through a preposition. Prepositions are parts of speech like of, in, on, under, above. You could ask, is the project of the earth, like Casa Malaparte? See how the house looks like it's almost part of the rock formation? Like it just came out of the rocks. Like it's of the rocky cliffs except for this perfect curving white wall, the whole project feels solid, a block of red rock that has spaces carved out of it. A stair has been cut into the top of the form. You can just go right from the rocks and ascend the stair to look out over the sea. Or is the project of the sky, like Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie. The living spaces in the house are elevated above the ground. And aside from the columns on the ground floor, everything's painted green to just blend into the meadow and the trees. The ribbon of windows running around the second floor makes you feel like you're in the trees when you're inside. So if you're analyzing a work or reflecting on your own design's relationship to the earth and sky, check out these diagrams. These were created by Stephen Hull, a famous architect who went to UW many years ago. Is the architecture below, in, on, above? Once you observe the architecture's relationship to the earth and sky, you ask, why is it like that? Given everything else you know about the project, why would the designer make the choice to have it relate to the earth or the sky? Think back to your ancient architectural history course. Think about those Greek temples. Given everything you learned about their spirituality and their culture, why would they design those temples the way they did? You know, to be elevated above the earth on flowing marble stairs and to raise up above and to put relief sculptures of Greek gods in the pediment at the top and have it be sort of pointed towards the sky. You won't be asked in this course to design a temple to the gods, but what I love about design is that you can tap into that same energy 
that same beauty and poetry that the ancient Greeks were tapping into when they designed their temples. You know, you get flowing on design, you create all these beautiful things and you start feeling this energy. I, I just, I love it. Um, by becoming an architect, right, you become a part of history. You're connected to these ancient ideas and you get to shape the future. Okay, that's earth and sky. Let's go into the next aspect, space and form. Space and form is actually a collection of interrelated ideas. You might also hear us talking about solid void, figure ground, or enclosure. Space and form in a lot of ways are opposites. Space is the volume that humans inhabit. It's enclosed or shaped by the form. If what you can see is the walls, floors, roof, or ceiling, the space is what you can't see. It's the invisible volume inside the surface. When we draw these spaces, especially in section, we can poche the earth, walls, floor, roof, and leave the space white, or we can invert that, leaving the enclosure white, and render the light inside the space. So if space is the invisible area inside the enclosure, then form is the opposite. Form is the physical thing we can see. It's the walls, it's the floor, it's the roof. It's the physical shape that the project takes. The Pantheon is a building that has round walls and a round roof. If you walked around the outside or spent time on the inside, you would sense its roundness in both space and form. In this course, we combine space and form to be one interrelated aspect. It's kind of like this image. Is it showing two faces in white? Or is it a black vase? Well, it's both. They work together. They respond to each other. Just like two people in a conversation, you say they're in dialogue. Things that are in dialogue are shaped by those that are, they are in dialogue with. Just like if you were in a conversation, listening to and talking with someone, your ideas can be shaped by the dialogue. Another example is the chapel at Ronchamp by Le Corbusier. Look at the curving roof from the outside. It feels dark and heavy, but oddly seems to be like it's sort of floating delicately on the white mass below. From the inside, the dark curved roof pushes down on the space. But look at the cracks of light between the wall and the roof. The heavy mass is pressing down on the space, but it seems to be floating inside too. So the form and the space are in dialogue. They're talking to each other. I've said enclosure a few times now, so let me define it. Enclosure is the form that surrounds or encloses the space. We talk about enclosure on a spectrum. There are degrees of enclosure from fully open, mostly open, mostly enclosed, or fully enclosed, and actually everything in between. Can you start to see how space and form and enclosure all kind of relate? A form that is only partially enclosed will give the space a sense of openness and light. A form that is mostly enclosed, except for a small opening, will make a space feel dark and tight like a cave. So when considering the space and form dialogue, the big thing to think about here is why. Why did the designer make the choices they made? If it's this cave-like dark space, why is it like that? Why'd they choose to do it that way? You know, if it's light and airy and open, again, what are the ideas driving that decision? Circulation refers to the pathways to and through an architectural project that physically connect all the spaces and often visually connect them as well. Circulation is how we move in and around architecture. Architecture is really just sculpture without our ability to go into it, to walk all around it and go up and down. So how people move around a project is absolutely primary to the project. It shapes our experience. There are two main types of circulation. There's horizontal, the pathways that you walk on, and then there's vertical, up and down. That's going to be either the stairs that you go up and down, or sometimes you'll see ramps. And then there are three main parts of a circulation system. There's the approach to the project. There's the entry or threshold into the project from the outside. And then there's all the various pathways in and around that project. Let's bring it back to ideas again, talking about the why. You know, because the circulation system is so central to the experience of the architectural work, it's critical that 
the ideas informing the circulation system relate to the idea that informs the project as a whole. So let's look at Casa Malaparte again. It's a house set on a rocky cliff on the Italian island of Capri, and it overlooks the Mediterranean Sea. I talked about this house feeling of the rocky cliffs, as if it almost naturally emerged out of the earth as another rock formation. Part of the roof of the house is a stair that ascends up over the house, shaping the form of the house and the spaces below, and leading those who climb up the steps to this beautiful wide open view of the sea. The stair adds this visual effect that makes the house feel like it's carved out of the rock, because there's nothing under the stair, it's just this solid thing. The stair just makes sense when you think about it this way. The way it's been designed, the way it's thought through to the larger idea of being of the rock, it really just makes sense. There's logic to it. But it wouldn't make sense in, say, the Farnsworth house, because the Farnsworth house is more floaty. It floats above the earth rather than being grounded in the earth. So it needs a different approach to the design of the circulation system. Daylight is the light that illuminates an architectural space from the sky. So in the context of architecture, daylight is all about the interior. It's how the light from the outside, the daylight, illuminates the interior space. As architects, we can design the enclosure or the form to bring in either direct light, where the light from the sun makes it directly into a space and you can actually see the light and the shadow clearly, or indirect light, where you can't see the source of the daylight, you can't see that window or that aperture because it's being bounced off of some other wall or it's washing over some other surface on the interior. So when designing for daylight, we need to consider how that opening that lets in the light, how it's made or how it's formed. Again, it's all about the ideas. Does the daylight look like it split open a heavy rock? Or maybe the light peeled back the wall. Does it carve open and filter through? Maybe it's a rhythm of cuts in a thin paper-like enclosure. Does it push back and notch the wall? Or maybe it flutters down like snowflakes. Daylight is so central to the architectural experience that project two will be all about daylight. You'll be designing an interior space and coming up with ideas about the light that drive the whole design. The big takeaway for all these architectural aspects is that the ideas that inform each individual aspect relate to the others and relate to the whole. So that when you're thinking about one specific aspect, you're able to say, you know, it just makes sense with the overall project. Okay, so that's an introduction to the four architectural aspects that we'll be working with this quarter. There are more resources, more images and readings available on Canvas to dig in deeper. I hope something in this video inspired you or made you more curious about architecture. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, of course, write them down and bring them to class.